So we've been going on this spiritual journey. <clears throat> we've been talking about different ways, <clears throat> excuse me, of practicing our spirituality so that they can help us to perceive the world in different ways and at some point help us live in the world in different ways. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about big things and we've talked a little bit about the practices that we need to do in order to walk this way of life. And so, so far, our journey has mainly been talking about us as individuals. That was the first leg of the journey. The second leg of the journey is about us as a community of faith. We don't practice our spirituality by ourselves. We practice it in community. And so today, we're going to hear a story from the Gospel of Mark that is extremely familiar and very short. And we're going to see if the things that we've started talking about in these last weeks help us to approach this story with new understanding. So it's found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. And it goes like this. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And Jesus said, and he said to him, teacher, all these I have observed from my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. At that teaching, his countenance fell, and the man went away sorrowful, grieving, for he had many possessions." What's happening in this story? I think usually we hear this story and we think maybe there's at least one of two things that went wrong, right? It didn't go right. The man came before Jesus and said, please tell me how, what I need to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus gave him a lesson. He taught him something. And it didn't lead to new life. It didn't lead to eternal life. It led to the man separating himself, going away sad and grieving. Why? What happened? What went wrong? Maybe we see what went wrong as being the man's fault. Right? The man goes before Jesus, says, what must I do? Jesus tells him, you lack one thing. Go and do this. And the man can't handle this teaching or refuses it. For whatever reason, can't follow through. And he goes away sad and grieving. Perhaps it's his fault. Jesus was there to teach him, and this guy can't accept the teaching. He must be doing something wrong. Well, the traditional way that we have of talking about when people do something wrong, there's a very particular word. Our tradition uses a particular word to describe what is wrong with someone who can't get into heaven, who can't follow Jesus, who can't inherit eternal life or go into the kingdom of God. What's that word? Oh, I heard a couple different ones. But mate, sin. Sin is the traditional word we have to talk about what is wrong with someone. What is preventing them from going into heaven. So we need to remember that the original Jewish word for sin talks about anything that separates us from God. Anything that separates us from God, separates us from neighbor, separates us from ourself. 
Um, later on, St. Paul, when he's teaching the Christian faith, he gives a little bit more clarity to this word. According to Paul, sin means disobeying the will of God. When you obey God's will, you have faith. When you disobey God's will, you have sinned. Okay? So this is the word we have traditionally used. Now, for a lot of us in this room, this word is really problematic. <laughs> Not for... <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. So, one problem with this word is that it has been so overused and so redefined by so many different communities and cultures and time periods that it really runs the risk of having lost all meaning. Depending on who you're talking to, one person may call something a sin and another person calls it their way of life. So it's problematic in that sense. It's a hard word to even define with any real certainty. Another really problematic thing about it is that this word has been used and repackaged and reused so often for the specific purpose of making some people feel shame and guilt about their lives, keeping them from ever trying to walk into a church, let alone walk the way of life or walk into heaven. So it's a really problematic word. So what if instead, well, let's put a pin in that. Okay, so maybe there's something wrong with the guy. We don't know how to talk about it, but maybe that's the case. Or maybe it was actually Jesus who did something wrong here. Maybe Jesus failed this guy. I mean, this guy shows up, he tells Jesus exactly what he wants, and Jesus looks at him with love and tells him, you lack one thing, and it results in the man going away grieving. Maybe Jesus did something wrong. Jesus tells the guy to do something that's really unreasonable. Right? It's really this unfathomable thing. It's this thing that is really difficult to do. Is that how hard it is to get into heaven? Are we expected to do things that are just completely unreasonable? Is that the only way that God will invite us to walk in the way of life, to go into heaven, by doing really unreasonable things? When we get going down that line of thought, it's easy to start thinking, God seems like a really demanding bully. It's, that's not the God that, I, that we preach about here in this church, or that we've been taught to believe in. We are taught to believe in a God that is all-loving, all-powerful, all-merciful, all-forgiving. So why would a teaching about communing with God be so incredibly obtuse and unreasonable and unrealistic? Why is the teaching so vague and the rewards even more vague? This doesn't sound like the God of life and the God of new possibility. This sounds like a cruel, cruel person. The issue at hand here is the issue of grace, right? We talk about God's grace as being the way that we understand God, the way that we experience God as all-loving, all-powerful, all-merciful, all-forgiving. And it's really difficult to believe in that good God and that God of grace when we hear the Bible teaching us of these really bizarre, unreasonable expectations. Do we have to walk in this narrow way of life or else we don't get to discover this grace? So those are two ways of looking at it. But if we take the resources that we've been developing, these spiritual practices over the last couple weeks, we get a different lens to see this story through. Maybe this is not an issue of any one party doing something wrong or failing in some way. Maybe this story is just an example of what happens when we have bad communication. Um, Emily and I went away with her parents this weekend, and we were playing a bunch of games. And while we were playing games, there was a story that was told about someone's experience with Uno. Are we all familiar with Uno? It's that card game where you, everybody gets a certain number of cards, and then you try to get rid of your cards, be the first one to get rid of all your cards. You say Uno when you have one left. 
Um, somebody had been playing Uno with a group and they noticed one person getting stuck with a lot of cards. They were just constantly drawing cards, drawing cards, drawing cards. And eventually one person in the group says, Uno, announcing that the game is almost over. And my friend looks over at this person with tons of cards and says, oh boy, you're never going to catch up now. You're really in trouble. And this person said, what do you mean? I have so many points. <laughs> They literally did not know that the purpose of the game was to get rid of cards. <laughs> Maybe that's what's happening in this story. No one's wrong. They're playing two different games. It's a miscommunication. God's grace doesn't exist in a vacuum. God's grace is not just a disembodied philosophical idea. It's actually something that needs to be communicated to us in a very clear way. And when we don't have ways, when we don't have symbols or images or stories or metaphors or allegories that help us to hear the same message, we can't help but be separated. We can't help but go away more sad than we were before because without common images and common metaphors, there's just bad communication, misunderstanding, and all of us are more likely to go away grieving. <coughs> A symbol that has been used for millennia to communicate God's grace to us is the image of fire. Fire is the chemical reaction, the embodiment of three separate things coming together as one. Fuel, oxygen, heat, all coming together to form a common flame. In the fire that is produced in this evolving dynamic power, this power that can be used to create and nourish or punish and destroy, fire communicates to us the nature of God's grace. It's perfect relationship between separate entities held together by a dynamic flow of transformational energy. None of the entities involved judge one another. They're not suspicious of one another. They simply give what they have and receive in kind. And that flow of giving and receiving, giving and receiving, creates this dynamic fire that transforms the world. It's a light to follow. It's a fire to provide nourishment and care. If we don't tend it carefully, it can get out of hand and burn down entire forests. God's grace is communicated to us most clearly through the symbol of fire. Meaning, God's grace is communicated to us most clearly when we are not separate from one another, but when we are in proper relationship to others. And the only way to find ourselves in proper relationship is to communicate clearly, which requires a lot of giving and receiving in equal measure. It's a fire that never consumes its host. It's a fire that never goes out. It was present from the beginning of time, and at the end of time it will be all that remains and it's a fire that all of us are invited to participate in and stand beside and be nourished by at the same time. A person goes in front of Jesus and says, I'm a good person. I've done everything right. What more must I do to earn eternal life? Jesus says, you lack one thing. You're trying to earn what is given freely. The person goes away sad and grieving because he has spent his whole life trying to earn what could only be received with gratitude. Miscommunication. That could be our waypoint for today. That could be one way of articulating what it is that separates us. When we find ourselves at this place where we have a deep need, we know that we are lacking something, but maybe we don't even know what it is. Maybe we ourselves can't even articulate what we need the most. 
And if we ourselves don't know how to communicate our need, then when someone else points it out to us, even if they're trying to help, we get sad, we get angry, we get hurt, and we go away grieving, separating ourselves from one another. So maybe that's the waypoint that we find ourselves at, where deep need intersects with bad communication. The inability to talk about what is most important to us and work together to meet one another's needs. The truest thing I know is that I have spent a big chunk of my life at this particular waypoint where I myself can't articulate what I need and since I can't name it, I can't turn to others to figure out how God is going to help me meet it. None of us wake up in the morning saying we're going to do something wrong today. We're going to do something that's hurtful or unhealthy or unhelpful today. None of us wake up saying that. But almost all of us on any given day can wake up with a deep need that we don't know how to meet. And when we don't know how to meet our own needs, we act out. We commit sins of many kinds trying to meet our needs without being able to communicate what they are. So friends, at this particular waypoint, we find ourselves in a sacred landmark, a place where we can go to practice our spirituality that helps us get out of this waypoint, get out of our own way. And that's a traditional word too. It's the act of confession. But not confessing our sins necessarily. We may not even know what that means anymore. But we do need to be able to confess what our need is. What are we lacking? And if we can't say it to ourselves, if we can't trust God with that, then we certainly can't trust one another with it. So, friends, we're in a sanctuary. This is your sanctuary. This is an open and free place for you to come and commune with the divine, to learn how to communicate what the needs are in your life and how God might offer you ways of meeting those needs. So as a way of closing this sermon, I want to invite us to practice this together. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. With your eyes closed, imagine the fire of God's grace burning right here among us. There is no need to fear this fire. It will not consume its host. It is a nourishing and life-giving fire. It invites us to be part of it and to rest beside it at the same time. Friends, in the presence of this fire, I invite you to take a moment and complete this sentence. My deepest need at this moment in my life is... Gracious God of new life and new possibility, you are leading the way. Right now, the thing keeping me from following is. Divine mystery, I want more for my life. I want to know I belong and I am loved and I have a purpose. But before I can do that, I have a need. And that need is... Take a moment to find the words to complete that sentence. 
sit before the common fire and allow God's divine grace to come through here and meet your deepest need.